My friends, we have finally arrived at the end of the section of Judges. If you've been following along with us as we've been reading the Bible in a year, you know that we have just finished reading the book of Judges and Ruth, and we are into Samuel, which hopefully will give us some reprieve of the very um, interesting, definitely violent section on Judges. So whenever we're at a pivot point, I like to kind of go back through the arc real quickly, what we've gone through, in case this is your first time joining us or you haven't been able to keep up. So as we talk, we'll plot these on a timeline for you. It begins with creation, um, and there were people in the world, and the world and God were completely in sync. Enter into temptation, temptation to disobey, and, God, um, and the humans forged out on their own way. And they became distracted by sin and evil, and the downfall just begins. Fast forward a little bit after the fall in the book of Genesis, we have Abraham. He is the main character, I guess you could say, in the book of Genesis. And there's this covenant that God makes with Abraham to have the many, as many descendants as there are stars in the sky. And through a lot of ups and downs, God is ultimately faithful to this covenant. Then we fast forward again, when we get into Exodus, we meet Moses, and he's the main character, you could say, of much of the rest of the first five books of the Bible. But Moses is called by God to help set the Israelites free from slavery in Egypt, and then enter into the promised land, which is the land of Cana. Now, throughout the journey um, into the wilderness, the people fight, and they moan, and they complain, and ultimately... They all die in the wilderness, except their children and Caleb and Joshua. And then, in the next point, Joshua leads the people into Canaan through a series of very violent and very off-putting battles that led the Israelites into the Promised Land. But that's not where the tragedy stops. Even when they're in the Promised Land, the Israelites have boundaries that God has set up. These rules, these regulations, these laws that are trying to help the Israelites hold fast to their identity as God's people and to be different than the Canaanites that surround them. The Canaanites were children's sacrificers and just all around bad people, but they break the rules. And as the scripture continues, chaos descends over time. And we have this dark, bleak picture. The priestly class, their leaders, take on the role of judges, which end up looking more like the Canaanites surrounding them than like the people that God has called them to be. They become self-reliant and self-focused instead of God-focused. And that's where we are today. It's a very a quick journey that ends with a little bit of sadness. And then we have this character that we meet in Samuel. But before we meet him, let's talk quickly about his parents. Hannah and Elkaniah were people who had wonderful faith and Hannah wanted a child so very desperately and if you have not read her story at the beginning of Samuel I encourage you to go do that but it ends with her giving birth to Samuel and he is this amazing child for whom she sets aside for God and he enters into what they call the Nazarite community which is a very holy sect of the people and in this time when he is weaned, but yet a still a young child, part of his life is to be living at the temple with Eli, who was the priest. And that's where our story opens today. Samuel and Eli are sleeping in the temple. Samuel, in fact, sleeps in the room with the Ark of the Covenant, which contains God's presence. And he is sleeping and he hears his name called Samuel. Samuel, and he jumps up and he runs into Eli's room and he says, yes, Eli, you called? And I kind of picture Eli, like any other parent, awoken from their sleep going, wait, what? No, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel goes back to sleep and a little while later, he hears his name again, Samuel, Samuel. And he jumps up and he runs back in there and he says, here I am, Eli, you called me. And Eli says, no, go back to sleep. So for a third time, Samuel hears his name, Samuel, Samuel. And the drama is mounting. You can read this in the text. And Eli has a realization this time. And he says, Samuel, this time, go back to sleep. And if he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So sure enough, 
Samuel goes back to sleep and he hears his name, Samuel, Samuel. And this time Samuel replies, speak, your servant is listening. And God does speak to him. I've always found this interchange so very interesting. On the surface, it's a simple story about a boy awakening his guardian, thinking that he had called them, and it's a sweet story. As a parent, though, I have been very impressed with Eli because he did not show more frustration to Samuel. As my children can tell you, I am not my nicest self when you wake me up in the middle of the night, and I would have had a lot less patience <laughs> than Samuel than Eli had with Samuel. Um, on a deeper level, I'm fascinated by this story, too, as an example that we are to look to for how do we be attentive and listen for God's voice in our own lives. For you see, Samuel was literally sleeping next to the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, and he mistook the voice of God for Eli. I had a person once come to my office and say, I want to know how to be attentive to the voice of God in my life, but I don't know how to hear it. And I, can you help me? She remarked that people in her life seemed to be so sure of what God was speaking to them, and they were confident, and she wanted that in her own life. And this is a very common problem. She's not the only one who has asked me this. Often we can look around at the people near us and say, they have it all together, and they know exactly what God is speaking to them. And they, some of them might, but more often than not, this is a deeply troubling thing to develop the skill for. To hone the skill of being attentive to the voice of God is not like flipping a light switch or giving a snap. There are tools that can help us. I don't know about you, but unlike Samuel, I have never heard the audible voice of God, but I have learned how to hone this skill. And so I have a list for you today. If you're a note taker, this is where you start writing a list of notes. And if you're like me, you want to know, well, how many points is she going to have so I know how much space to leave? I have five. So here we go. For point number one to developing the skill of attentiveness, listening to the voice of God, is to develop a good habit of prayer. A prayer life should reflect us the times where we sit down with our list that we're praying for and spend dedicated time talking to God with our list of concerns and our gratefulness. But a prayer life can also be, as 1 Thessalonians describes it, an unceasing conversation. This kind of prayer life takes practice and time, but when you reach that point, you begin to know what God's voice sounds like in your life because it is a constant rhythm of back and forth, just going about life together. Point number two. You need to listen to your mentors. Samuel didn't know what God's voice sounded like. He needed Eli to point it out to him. Last week when we talked about Ruth and Naomi, one reason that I think Ruth stayed loyal to Naomi was Naomi's role as a mentor in Ruth's life. It is imperative in our Christian journeys that we have people in our lives that point us towards God's voice in our life, in our own lives. These people can be your pastors, your friends, your parents, your spouse, teachers. And if you're seeking to have a deeper relationship, it is important in developing this skill. For growing in your relationship with God, we must listen to our mentors as Samuel listened to Eli. Number three is developing what we call in the Methodist tradition an inward and an outward confirmation. In the United Methodist Church, when a person is feeling called to ordination, they must both feel the call internally, which for me felt almost like I was physically drawn towards ordination. But that isn't enough. As in Samuel's story, after he knows that God has called him, the scripture goes on to tell us that the community around him also affirmed that call in Samuel. And this is what happens in the United Methodist Church. For those of us who go into ordination, not only do we have to feel an inward call, but our local church has to agree and send us to the district. Then our district, our kind of local geographical area, also, through a series of interviews, the people appointed to that committee also have to agree. And then they send you on to a bigger Florida conference or state conference board to also agree. So there's this 
playback of inward and outward connection. And that's another way we can feel attentive to God's voice. We do this here locally in our church leadership as well. At nominating season, we have a list of people whom we think God is calling into leadership. And we'll go to each and every one of you and we will say, we feel God might be calling you into fill in the blank. But it's not enough for us to say God is calling you. We want you to go and pray about this and see if your inward confirmation is there as well. And sometimes leaders know immediately God has spoken to their intuition and said yes. And we get a quick response. And sometimes it takes prayer and discernment on on part of the person that we have asked. This is a deeply important process of developing the skill of listening to God's voice, of being attentive to God's voice in our lives. Number four, are you still with me? Good. We need to practice overcoming hurdles. Nobody ever promises that our Christian journey will be easy or that listening to God's voice is as simple as an audible response. Along the way, there are always hurdles and hardships. This is a fact. But one way that I know that God is calling me to do something is that the obstacles that I do face often become overcomable, which I think I just made up that word and that's okay. But they, these obstacles that come in my way, the hurdles, they're not impossible. They may be difficult, but not impossible. And there's a reverse to this is true. Often when I'm being called, when I feel like I'm being called into something, If each door seems to be closing and it becomes harder and harder to fulfill what that call is, I think, oh, maybe God's not calling me into this. For example, before I felt called to ministry, I thought I was going to be a doctor, right? So I went on to this path and I went to college. Sure enough, it turns out I was not good at biology. (laughs) I'm not going to tell you the grades that I got, but it was very clear that I was not called to be a doctor. And as soon as I discerned this call into ministry, it was as if all of the doors opened. In fact, at two prior churches, I vaguely even remember, I don't even really remember interviewing for the job that I had. That's how open it got to be. Every journey is different, but there will always be hurdles or hardships. And paying attention to which ones seem possible and impossible can help us define how God is calling us. Lastly, and this is number five, it's important that in our developing this rhythm of listening to God, that we don't forget to look at the big picture. I'm a details person, you know this about me. And so this skill of taking, of stepping back and looking at the big picture is not one that is easy. I want to demonstrate that for you. On your screen, you see a picture and it is one of those connect the dots, but I didn't connect the dots for you. What do you think it is? I got it wrong too. Let's look and see what it is. See, here's the thing. When we are so narrowly focused on the one dot, we can't see the larger picture. We have to develop the skill of stepping back and seeing what God is doing in our community. In other words, if we are looking at only our lives and only what we're doing and we're forgetting about the community around us, we are not listening attentively to God's voice because God always calls us within a community. Developing this habit of attentiveness to God's voice is not always simple or quick. In fact, it likely will never be simple and quick. But for people of deep faith, it can still be hard all the way through. If you think back over those five steps that I just gave you, and you think back over the scripture that we reviewed at the beginning, Notice that the Israelites did, in fact, not follow the list. They didn't listen to God. They looked only at themselves to try to figure out where God was leading. And instead of developing a pattern of self-reflection and prayer, they turned inward on themselves and forged their own way. And it was violent and bloody and ultimately led to self-destruction. For you see, at the beginning of time, God set up the world so that humans were drawn into a relationship with God. And a deep relationship is not following a list of right and wrong or a list of rules, but it's about joining in with God in our lives. Think about it this way. If you've ever had children or if the metaphor works better for you, that you, let's say you're a boss and you're training an employee. 
There is a list of rules of rights and wrongs that you're teaching your child or your employee. Things that you're supposed to do, things that you're not supposed to do. But every parent knows that if you just simply follow the list, it's not quite enough. That our children or our employees must learn what it means to be in, to how to develop a pattern of this rhythm of life together. The whole beginning of the story of humanity is filled with people who have tried to go out on their own. They had a list of rules of right and wrongs and they couldn't follow it. And that will continue as we read the scriptures together. And our job as Christians is to instead define just a list of right and wrong. We are defining what does it mean to live in God's family? How do we listen to God's voice and the community around us? Susan Robb says that being attentive to God's voice is our call. As we continue our scripture's journey with Samuel over the next few weeks and into the rest of this year, we learn that he did develop this habit of attentiveness to God. He doesn't always get it right, and neither will we. But he plays an important role in God's story, in our own story. He sets a scene and an example for us, and you can develop the skill. You can hone your skill of being attentive to what God is saying to you. It is an important work of our deepening relationship with God, of listening, of prayer, of being in community, and doing this all so that we can partner with God and what God is doing in our world. And what a gift that God desires this relationship with each and every one of us. Amen. Amen.